So this is an introduction to proteins. So last time we talked about amino acid chemistries and proteins are comprised of amino acids shown here with an amino group, a carboxy group, and an R group. And we saw how different R groups can react in addition to the amino and the carboxy group. Now, amino uh, acids that are linked up from 50 to 300 uh, amino acids form a polypeptide chain or, uh, or a protein. And um, depending on the amino acid side chain, it uh, gives it uh, different properties, which we'll discuss in a bit. Now, um, all bioprocesses are mediated by proteins, and all proteins are comprised of these linear combinations of amino acids. So like I said, an amino acid is comprised of an amino group and a carboxy group and at the alpha carbon, an R chain, and this carbon is the alpha carbon and anything extending beyond in the R group beyond the alpha would be beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, etc. Tyrosine example is alpha, beta, gamma, delta 1, delta 2, epsilon, epsilon 1 and 2, zeta and eta. Under physiological pHs, uh, amino acids are uh, as, as witter ion. pK of the carboxy is 3, pK of the amine is uh, 9, as shown here. So here are the 20 amino acids showing all the side chains um, in as the R groups uh, in, the, in each of the examples shown here. What you're going to need to know for this course and for all exams is the names of the amino acids, the symbols, three letter as well as the singular um, letter, and, and the PKs of the carboxy and the amine as well as the R groups. Certain R groups have um, PK values. Um, now there are 22 amino acids which include selenocysteine and uh, pyrolysine, but for this course um, you will only have to know the 20 amino acids shown here, and you'd need to know that these are hydrophobic, these are polar, these are acidic, these are um, uh, basic, and then you have your hydrophobic aromatic slash groups, and then you have proline here, which would be um, a kink-inducing amino acid, which we'll talk about later on. Now, the other thing that I'd like you to note, and I'm going to move this down a little bit so that I have some room to draw, is that over here, they're showing the amino acids. It's linear without showing stereochemistry. In all of your um, exams and problem sets, what I'd like you to do is show your amino acids, and I'm drawing one here, in the appropriate stereochemistry. Oops, sorry. It's a little bit hard for me to draw here, but doing it like this. So shown here is an L-amino acid, and I'm showing the proper stereochemistry where the R group is coming out of the page over here. So my expectation is when you're drawing polypeptides for your problem sets and exams, you're drawing it with the stereochemistry in mind. Okay, so the next slide um, is going to be so the next slide um, is shown here. This actually focuses more on the properties of the amino acids. So as you can see, it gives you the molecular weights or masses of all the amino acids, the 20 that I told you um, that you would uh, need to know. It also provides um, information on the surface, the volume, the pK is again the ones, um, these are only the side chains and the ones that have a pK. PI, solubility, as well as density. Now, um, you would need to know these properties and these properties, how these properties are important for certain types of proteins. And um, as I had said before, uh, certain amino acids are hydrophobic, and as you can see, the aromatic ones give high values in the 200s, above the 200s, um, while others are not as uh, hydrophobic with a high surface volume. And so these are other properties that um, I, ex I encourage you to take a look at. Um, here are references for you to um, further probe these properties, but um, what I want you to understand is that different amino acids have different properties that are useful um, in when they are folding and um, producing a conformation for function. So here is a hydrophobicity scale in more detail of the 20 amino acids. 
Um, some of the features that I'd like to point out is you have these hydrophobic, aliphatic amino acids up to here, and then aromatic type amino acids. And as you can see, um, you have hydrophobic, like the most hydrophobic uh, um, amino acid, at least in terms of uh, for residue burial, is leucine as well as tryptophan shown here. So this is an aliphatic, this is an aromatic, but you can also have um, residues that are charged, for example, lysine, uh, which, are, which is basic, also having a substantial surface area and um, a, a big effect because of the aliphatic chain in between the amine um, and the C-alpha carbon. Um, so, so you can have this dual property of having something that is um, hydrophobic as well as being charged. So um, the peptide bond or the amide bond undergoes resonance stabilization as shown here. You have the amide bond between two amino acids. Then you have electrons from the nitrogen. So I'm going to draw a little electrons here. Go in, form the double bond, and then kick those electrons out so that you generate something that looks like this. And so you have this transplanar conformation in which, because of this resonance stabilization, you have now, a, at the C-alpha bond, these phi and psi angles that can be rotated uh, in a polypeptide chain. So it's interesting, because of this resonance stabilization, a typical CN bond is 1.4, angstrom's typical C double bond N is 1.27, but the peptide CO, C double bond O to NH right here is in between 1.33 angstroms. This also produces a dipole moment um, in that uh, direction, uh, about 3.5 Dubai. Sorry, if you can please bear with my uh, writing. Um, and essentially, because of this, you have. In order to twist or break this um, bond, you need at least 70 to 90 kilojoules per mole in order to do that because of the um, resonance stabilization. In general, um, if we look at a polypeptide chain, the max distance between corresponding atoms of adjacent amino acids, so here's one to another, that distance is 3.5 angstroms um, to 3.8 angstroms when in this trans configuration. And, um, and the other thing that we need that I'd like you to note is that in trying to form the bond, I'd like you to show again the stereochemistry. And in terms of chemistry, we had discussed before where we take an amino acid um, with another amino acid, essentially that's a uh, uh, dehydration where the carboxylic acid and the amine group um, react with one another to form the amide bond. Um, and so this peptide back backbone, that the amide bond that's generated here, is very, very uh, stable. Its half-life is approximately seven years at neutral pH at room temperature. In terms of classification of protein architectures, you have primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. Primary structure are essentially the amino acid sequence. Secondary structure gives more detail. You have alpha helices and beta sheet um, that are elements of secondary structure. Tertiary structures are formed by packing of structure, uh, structural elements that are the secondary structures. Um, and they form more globular domains. And then the quaternary structures contain several polypeptides that have tertiary structure um, to assemble and form this quaternary structure. In terms of protein conformation, Secondary structures essentially is defined by um, the angle of rotation between the C alpha and the C, uh, the C and the C alpha and the N. And so Ramachandran developed a uh, 
plot that can identify protein conformation in which you have um, uh, phi and psi angles, uh -oh, as well as omega angles shown here, in which the omega um, angles can um, range all the way up to 180, same with phi, uh, psi and phi. And so when you plot uh, phi psi uh, angles in this Ramachandran plot shown here, you can uh, identify whether protein conformation, at least the secondary structures, are of beta sheet if it's in within this quadrant, an alpha helix that's right-handed, which is in this quadrant, and a left-handed alpha helix, which is in this quadrant. Some examples of Ramachandran plots are shown here. Here's an example of this alpha helix. Um, and the alpha helix, this is an actual real example of an alpha helix in which Ramachandran plot is generated. And as you can see, um, predominantly the um, phi and psi angles reside in this quadrant. And so this uh, uh, value of 57 uh, phi or negative 57 phi and negative 47 psi is indicative of a right-handed alpha helix. If we look again at the com conformation of the Ramachandran plot, that's where is that essentially where um, the right-handed alpha helix is plotted. Now here's an example of a beta sheet-like protein in which now you have values predominantly in this region of the quadrant where phi is within 110 to 100, negative 140, right? And then psi is in the positive range with 110 to 135. And so um, this is showing that it is uh, mostly beta sheet within this quadrant. For uh, right-handed alpha helices, which are predominant, Phi is about minus 57.8, psi is about 47.0. The main chain carbonyl of this alpha helix um, has hydrogen bonds, shown in the green dots, um, to the amide NH4 uh, residue, um, NH4 residues um, from uh, the C double bond O. Uh, amino acid, and, and that stabilizes this conformation. Um, and in this conformation, there are about 3.6 residues per turn. Um, and then if we look down at the barrel of this helix, you can see that the residues are projected outward. The helical pitch per turn is 5.4 angstroms. Um, and uh, the first and last amino acids of, a, of an alpha helix can provide hydrogen bonds as well. If we look further in an alpha helix, there's a helix dipole. So many of the atoms in proteins carry partial charges due to their electronegativity. And it presents a helix dipole in that direction. And because there's II plus 4 hydrogen bonding, you see an overall alignment of this helix dipole, right, going in the direction um, where you have your positive end going to the minus end. And so you have an overall um, dipole extending in this direction, where, I've, where each of these have a, a dipole. Many structural proteins contain amphiphatic helices, which essentially has hydrophobic and hydrophilic residues uh, around a cylinder. The cylinder is represented from A, um, B all the way through uh, G, um, and the amino acids, because they have uh, 3.6 um, uh, amino acids per turn, you can plot it in a wheel that's 360 um, around a circle to generate these uh, helical wheels. Now, because the amphiphatic helices have a hydrophobic side and a hydrophilic side, oftentimes they assemble where the hydrophobics interact with one another, shown here in the AD position. 
Uh, the amphiphasticity of an alpha helix can be determined by plotting the primary amino acid sequence in this helical wheel, which is essentially a projection down the helical axis. The amino acid side chains are projected down the axis, the axis of an alpha helix orthogonal to the paper plane, shown here, right? Again, it, it's all from A, B, C, D, E, oops, F, and G. Um, and um, it's, it's a useful way to uh, determine um, whether these helices can interact and looking at alpha helices um, in the context of other um, uh, proteins. Solvent. So um, exposed helices are often bent away from the solvent region. This is because the exposed CO groups tend to point towards the solvent to maximize the hydrogen bonding capacity. Um, they tend to form hydrogen bonds uh, to the solvent as well as uh, have the as well as the NH groups. Um, so there's a bend in the helical axis um, when you have these uh, amphiphatic helices. Like I said, because they're amphiphatic, you have hydrophobics and hydrophobics interacting with one another, forming what are called coiled coils. Coiled coils have what is known as a heptad repeat right, A through G, with nonpolar residues at positions A and D, and electrostatic interactions or residues between residues E and G. And so shown here is a sequence of uh, a, a coiled coil protein. They're alone as a single alpha helix, they're unstable, um, but they become very stable in coiled coil because of the interactions between the hydrophobic residues, right, between the A and D positions. The chains in a coil coil have the polypeptide chains aligned parallel in the exact axial register. This maximizes the coil coil formation between the chains as shown here. A coil coil is a protein motif that is often used to control oligomerization. While we've shown you dimers, there's trimers, tetramers, pentamers, and you know, higher oligomer uh, states. And essentially, they involve the number of these alpha helices that wind around each other like a strands in the rope. Leucine zipper coiled coils in the A and D position are predominantly leucines. So here's an example um, originally uh, identified in the liver transcription factor, CEBP. It has leucine every seventh position in a 28th residue segment. So here's an example of gen uh, leucine zipper in which you have a sequence shown here. And there are several leucines. We see one, we see two, three, four, five uh, leucines in the sequence. And identifying the leucines first, you can then situate these leucines, sorry, um, in the A and D positions to generate the actual uh, helical. So here's an example of the leucine zipper coiled coil. The hydrophobic leucines are interacting with another, one another, and you see this uh, twist. It takes about 3.5 residues to make a complete turnaround in alpha helix. So the helical, uh, from the helical wheel projection, there are seven different positions for amino acid residues along the circumference of the helix. If you look at it from the end terminus, they're labeled from A to G in a clockwise manner so that the residues in positions A and D form the hydrophobic interface uh, between the uh, two helices. But there's, exact, there's actually a slightly more than 3.5 residues per one turn. As a result, you have a slight inclination of a hydrophobic stripe by the residues in the A and D position and the helices then, as you can see, cross between 0 to three, 30 degrees. Since we're looking at um, alpha helices and um, looking at the properties of amino acids, uh, O'Neill and DeGrado um, looked at uh, how certain amino acids shown here may exhibit either helical propensity or not. And so alanine is known to have a very high helical prop uh, propensity. So is arginine and lysine and leucine, right? The leucine zipper had um, lots of uh, leucines in the dimer interface of a coiled coil. But note that glycine 
doesn't have a high helical propensity, actually it's at zero. And then proline is actually a helix, helix buster. That means it's not, necess it's, it's not likely in a helix, uh, to be in a helix because it would uh, generate a kink in the chain. 310 helices. Um, these have a phi and psi angles that are negative 74 and 4 respectively. It has a hydrogen bond pattern of II plus 3 shown here. Um, the hydrogen bonds within a 310 helix display a repeating pattern in which the backbone of the CO um, reside in the I hydrogen bonds to the backbone of the um, HN of the I plus 3 shown here. And so um, as I'm showing you the different properties in terms of phi psi as well as hydrogen bond patterns, my expectation is that um, for this course you'll know this and especially for um, problem sets in an exam. After the alpha helix, beta structures are uh, the next most um, predominant conformation and uh, beta Beta structures or beta sheets are comprised of a beta strand, and a beta strand is essentially an extended polypeptide. A strand alone itself is not stable, rather it becomes stable in a beta sheet um, where you have then hydrogen bonding patterns um, to stabilize it, right? Alone it doesn't have any hydrogen bonding patterns like the alpha helix which has it within a single helix, beta strand is, does not. Phi psi angles, uh, phi psi omega angles are minus 120, 120, and 180 with res uh, respectively. And again, um, we, you should know these angles um, for your problem sets and exams. Uh, beta sheets consist of pairs of chains lying side by side. So beta sheets uh, are represented as these arrows, as you can see, and the directionality of the arrow the end terminus is on the end of the arrow and the tip of the arrow becomes the C terminus. They're stabilized by hydrogen's bond between the carbonyl atoms on one chain with another NH group on the adjacent chain. Chains are often anti-parallel with the N and C. Show, so anti-parallel, as you can see, this is going one direction, it's going the opposite direction with the N and C terminal being reversed to each other. Beta strands can exist as anti-parallel as well as, uh, as parallel beta strands to form sheets. Um, we, the most conventional and more stable one is the anti-parallel beta sheet in which you see hydrogen bonding aligning between the two anti-parallel strands um, so that the dipole moments of the strands are also aligned. In the case of a parallel beta sheet, you see hydrogen bonding, but they're staggered. So they're a bit less stable than that of uh, anti-parallel, um, but yet the parallel beta sheets also exist um, in nature. Parallel beta sheets have these staggered hydrogen bonds, um, and it's known that uh, parallel beta sheets of less than five strands are rare. Um, uh, leading us or leading us to believe that these distorted hydrogen bonds are less stable than the um, hydrogen bonds of a uh, anti-parallel beta sheet. And the ideal beta sheet is planar and flat. In the context of proteins, beta sheets have this right-handed twist, so as shown here, possibly due to interactions between the backbone and the chiral L amino acid chains. So extended polypeptide chain beta sheets tend to be twisted for greater stability um, and rigidity. So if you take a sheet of pa paper, if it's, if it's straight, it's flexible. But if you introduce a slight twist to it, there's going to be some rigidity and uh, stability. And so there's a twisting feature that's common in beta sheets um, to stabilize the structures. This twist then weakens the hydrogen bond slightly. Um, and so the geometry of a beta sheet is a compromise essentially between optimizing the conformations of that polypeptide chain as well as preserving the hydrogen bonds. The other feature about beta sheets is that beta sheet residues are about seven angstroms apart along a beta strand, but 4.5 um, apart between adjacent strands. 
So if we look at this, we see that it's 4.5 apart between adjacent strands, but seven angstroms apart um, along the strand. One protein in nature, silk, um, is essentially an all beta sheet protein. It's comprised of these amino acids, glycine, serine, glycine, alanine, glycine, alanine, that's repeated. And these sheets uh, stack to form these microcrystalline arrays, leading to these strong mechanical properties where um, they are um, very durable but cannot be extendable. Except in the case of silk, like before. Um, because of the close distance between residues on the adjacent strands of beta sheets, which are 4.5 angstroms, you cannot produce regular patterns of intercalations. Rather, you can have a beta sheets of, the, of pairs that are packed together that could be aligned or, as shown here, orthogonal. Right? So one is going in one direction, the other one is going in the other direction. Some examples, famous examples of orthogonal packed beta sheets are immunoglobulin, uh, fibronectin and type 3 folds. In aligned sheets, the right-handed twist leads to an angle between the strands of approximately 30 degrees. As you can see here, um, there's a 30 degree angle, but can vary between 20 to 50 degrees. Orthogonal beta sheet packings consist of beta sheets folded on themselves, as you can see here. Uh, the two sheets make an angle of uh, minus 90 and the sheets may contact only along uh, one diagonal, as shown here. So now that we have gone through beta sheets and alpha helices, as well as 310 helices, there are um, other uh, conformations, such as super secondary structures. When you take secondary structure elements and combine them in specific geometric arrangements. So, an example of this is shown here where you have a beta strand which is then linked by a hairpin to another beta strand. And uh, the nomenclature for residues in the beta hairpin termin are shown here where you have B1, B2, that's on the uh, one strand, B1, B2 on the other strand, and then L1, L2 from the um, hairpin. And all here, are the um, hairpin loops uh, that are important for uh, the two beta strands to come together. And depending on its arrangement, you can have the carbonyl and the nitrogen going out or to the back, um, shown here. Under supersecondary structure reverse turns, there's type 1 and type 2 shown here in terms of its turn structures. Here is the hydrogen bonding and you can see that there's a difference between type 1 and type 2 in which you, you can actually determine those differences in a Ramachandran plot where you have I, I plus 2 type 2 and I plus 2 I plus 1 type 1 interactions shown here type 1 and type 2 interactions. Well, in the previous case, you've seen two residue beta hairpins. You can also have three and four uh, residue beta hair, hairpins as well. And an example of here uh, is a three residue beta hair, hairpin in which you have one, two, three residues, and then you have the I, um, I plus three interactions showing, um, showing those interactions in the Ramachandran plot shown here. You can also have helix hairpins. Helix hairpins are also known as alpha-alpha hairpins. Um, you have essentially a hairpin that links two alpha helices um, that are anti-parallel next to one another. And so in this case you have um, the hairpin stabilizing, being stabilized by the helix itself of at least the first helix shown here. Four adjacent antiparallel beta sheets are frequently arranged in um, what is called Greek key motifs shown here. Here where you have the beta sheets being linked by these hairpin elements to generate a folded protein. There, these Greek key uh, motifs are found frequently in nature and um, they're named after a, pat a pattern common, uh, commonly seen on Greek pottery. So 
we've seen Greek pottery that show these types of patterns. This is uh, named after that. So here is plasticyanin, which has this Greek key pattern, and it shows you the connectivity between each of the sheets, and then it folds into this um, nice conformation. Structural changes in the loop regions between strands three and four may account for the eventual folding, so three and four are close together, allowing this to assemble. Connecting anti-parallel sheets with short loops is simple, right? So these are all anti-parallel to one another um, because the connected ends of the beta strands are close together. This allows it to assemble and fold. But then the question is, how can parallel beta strands be connected, right? So he's, here are only examples of anti-parallel uh, beta sheets, but why, how, is, how does nature solve the problem of trying to put these in parallel? without having something anti-parallel. Well, the two uh, parallel beta strands can be connected, and the way nature has figured that out was it's connecting it through a different motif, in this case, an alpha helix. So if we take one beta strand going in this direction and we want to align it so it's in the same direction, uh, nature has figured out that they have that by inserting an alpha helix in between, that leads to this beta alpha beta motif, which then allows these two anti-parallel beta strands to um, uh, interact with one another and then connect. So when you have these alpha beta structures, you see that the parallel beta sheets. Uh, have the alpha helix kind of slightly above the plane of the beta sheets so that you have um, alpha helices packing against this central beta sheet core. And so this, this multiples of these beta alpha beta form what is called a Ross, Rossman fold, and this motif is always right-handed. The beta alpha beta structure shown here um, it can be um, repeated to generate a Rossman fold, and what's notable is that the alpha helix lies a slightly above the plane of the beta sheets that are anti-parallel to another, uh, leading to a layered um, packing against this beta sheet of these alpha helices. This beta alpha beta subunit is known as uh, Rossman fold after Michael Rossman. In terms of a topology of alpha-beta barrel, you have a single sheet uh, direction in, one, in this one direction where you have these betas anti-parallel and the alpha helices slightly above. So if the first strand of the beta sheet hydrogen bonds with the last strand, the structure closes in on itself like a barrel. And so this structural motif was first observed um, in the crystal structure of tri triosphosphate isomerase, or TIM, so it's also known as a TIM fold. And here was, TIM was one of the earliest enzymes whose structure was solved. If we look at the alpha-beta barrel, we can see again, there's a core um, of beta sheets that are, anti, that are parallel, and then on the outside you have these alpha helical um, rings uh, that are surrounding this beta, sh beta sheet. So the residues of the beta strands have a strong tendency to have hydrophobic side chains. That's why it packs on the inside. Um, and it also has this uh, right-handed twist. One of the simplest packing arrangements of a domain of two helices um, are done by this motif, helix turn helix, shown here. You have the turn region um, stabilizing and uh, the helices coming together, shown here. This is another example where this can recognize DNA. This is ROP, which binds RNA. Um, and so th this motif is used uh, to create helical helices that come together. Four helix bundles are helice helix turn helices assembled together where you have um, four helices uh, interacting with their hydrophobic 
cores uh, interacting with one, or one another and then um, the exposed hydrophilic surface. It's very similar to coiled coils, why which then just come together, but these are then connected by turn segments. So and here's an example of cytochrome B562. In the previous slides, we started, we've gone from simple alpha helices to um, structures where you have alpha helices and beta sheets forming these tertiary structures. And now there's quaternary structure. Here's a quaternary structure of F1 ATPase in which units of tertiary structures come and assemble to form hetero or homomultimers. And um, these are common, especially in the case of enzymes. So in summary, uh, we've talked about primary uh, and essentially which describes just the amino acid um, being linked to one another. Important features that I need you to know are the chirality is always L. Length of an amino acid is typically 3.6 angstroms. Peptide bond is stabilized by resonance. Their in planar trans configuration. Backbone configuration is restricted by side chains and has a permanent dipole of 3.5 dibi. Secondary structures essentially describes the hydrogen bond connectivities of chemical stress sequence. Um, alpha helix we had discussed, which have hydrogen bonds that join, sorry, this should be I, I, I plus 4. It's characterized by N, the number of residues, and the rise per helical uh, residue. For an alpha helix, N is 3.6, and the rise is 5.4 angstroms. They have I, I plus 4, carbonyl to NH, distance of 2.86, and has a net macrotypole of N times 3.5 Dubai. And this points towards the solution. And then the side chains tilt towards the N terminus. The other secondary structure was the beta structures. There are hydrogen bonds between different linear sequence. They're fully extended. So the distance between side chains on the same side is about seven angstroms. Distance between strands in the sheet is 4.5. You have parallel and anti-parallel in which parallel, the strands are oriented in the same directions and is less stable than anti-parallel, which uh, the strands are in the opposite um, section. Tertiary structures, it's how the secondary structure units associate with a single polypeptide chain to keep a 3D structure. Function of a protein depends on its tertiary structures. So if that tertiary structure is disrupted, the protein becomes the nature. We talked about supersecondary motifs, alpha-beta structure, Rossman fold, alpha-beta barrel. More on the tertiary structure. Domains are structurally independent units that each has the characteristic of a small globular protein. So if you use limited proteolysis of multi-domain proteins, you can liberate these tertiary domains. Um, they're large polypeptide chains and can fold into small globular clusters or domains. And the domains typically consist of 100 to 200 amino acids with an average diameter of 25 angstroms. Predominantly, these domains are se have a separate function and can that can pre be um, within a context of the, the overall quaternary protein. Quaternary structures essentially uh, defines the, is defined by the assembly of different tertiary structures. Uh, quaternary structures are formed by non-covalent interactions between different molecules, each of which is called a subunit. And subunits that are, form a quaternary structure can contain the same sequence or have different sequences. Different tertiary structures associate to form quaternary structures. So as an example of uh, classification of protein ar architecture, if I were giving you this example and asking you questions about what, the what is the primary structure, you would, ident you would uh, give a sequence. Secondary structures, you would identify alpha helices and beta sheets. Super secondary would be, for example, these beta hairpin turns. Domains, you have three domains here. You have alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3. Um, tertiary structure, alpha 1, 2, and 3, is a single folded subunit. And then this is a different. So uh, the beta 2 M is a different molecule that associates to form this quantum. Physical interactions that determine uh, the properties of proteins. Biological activities of proteins are mediated by the simultaneous non-covalent interactions within the molecule. 
interactions with water, salts, and other ions, interactions with membranes, interactions with other proteins. Physical nature of the forces that underlie these interactions is well understood for molecules in a vacuum and solids, but not in liquids. So solvent is complex and the inter interactions are transient. Full and conformation of most proteins exists only in a liquid environment, except membrane proteins, right, and multi subunit proteins. Thus, from all of this, the important interactions that determine the properties of proteins are, right, electrostatic interactions as well as hydrophobic interactions. And so in terms of electrostatic interactions, it's governed by um, magnitude of charges, their separation, their permittivity of free space, as well as the dielectric constant of the medium. In this case, it's water. Um, so, in general, it's practical to consider only interactions between the nuclear uh, centers and ignore the electrons to get a sense of the interactions, uh, electrostatic interactions. And the other um, important driving force is hydrophobicity. So the major driving force for protein folding is um, the hydrophobic effect where they're bearing the cluster of hydrophobic chains to minimize our contact with water. This allows uh, compacting of structures, minimize the hydrophobic area that's exposed to solvent, and then you can bury the hydrogen, the hydrogen bonds within the folded structure so that they're paired. Globular proteins thus have hydrophobic cores with charge groups on the outside. And if you think about a protein, packing density is 75% for proteins and 70 to 78% for crystals. This concludes um, this lecture two, um, and then we'll continue on with lecture three in the next series.